Well, welcome. Welcome to uh, the Time to Revive studio. We're here in person. We've got some good friends and family. And then we have some friends and family that are online. And I want to just say what a joy and an honor. It's great to be back into a, a brand new studio. So the last time we did a teaching series in here, uh, and by the way, this is totally interactive, uh, was The End Times where we did a series called To Number Our Days, which, by the way, you can listen to that on podcast if you want to listen to 32 weeks, uh, 32 lessons of uh, really what we believe is a, a very unique and accurate picture of what we believe is to come. And uh, I, think, I think, Robert, it's fair. That time has radically impacted all of our lives. <laughs> Your friend and buddy is now overseas uh, getting ready for more. And I just think to me, when I think about that life scenario, I wonder what the Lord's going to do with this series. I wonder what he's going to do here and how does that unpack. And so uh, I see some of our friends. I just want to say hello briefly here. I see we got some friends from Indiana, friends from Texas, not too far, Granbury. Uh, I see some friends in Ohio, but I also see some friends on from Ghana, Africa, uh, Nepal. Anybody know where Nepal is? Uh, we have some friends on here from Liberia, and uh, right next to Liberia, North Dakota. Just kidding, but North Dakota is up north, and it is a ways. So anyway, uh, if you're not familiar with our Time to Revive team, if maybe this is your first time ever watching or tuning in to one of our series, uh, I'd love to have our team introduce ourselves. So Tom, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, and I don't know, what, are you ready to do another series? Tom Jankowski, and well, that's really loud, and I'm running the camera. I'm here. <laughs> Gonna stay awake. Tom is here. Tom did, we did, if you didn't do this before, we did Revive School before To Number Our Days, where we did two years of everyday teaching back here, uh, and that was Tom's position right there behind the camera. Uh, Kevin, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Kevin McRibby. Uh I help get the scriptures up for Kyle as he's teaching and provide any um, along-the-way commentary as we go. Some unique banter? Yeah. It's probably a good way of putting that's, it, unique that's banter. That's a good way. You know, and here's the deal. If you don't know this, Kevin is known as the Kev. Uh, whether we're at Cofield Prison, where they have Revive School, largest prison in Texas is carrying Revive School. He's known as the Kev, but he's also known that everywhere. But Kevin and I have just kind of grown together in the Word. It's been really, really fun to watch uh, unfold. And I know you don't have a camera next to to you, Kevin. But next to Kevin, we have Elizabeth Goodwin, I think. Yeah, there she is. There's her hand. Uh, Elizabeth is doing a lot of our behind the scenes work. We're honored that she's here. And then we're going to go into the editing room. Rich, you want to introduce yourself and your wife? Yeah. Hello. I'm Rich. That right there is my wife, Shelly. She's running audio. I'm just switching cameras. And Rich for and Shelly. Rich and We Sh all work for the Kev. You all work for the Kev. That's true. Whatever Kev says, we do. Uh, and I just want to just recognize they built this whole set. Rich and Shelly, for us, that's a big deal. Uh, super, super excited. I see some of our other friends that have joined us. We've got the, the Teshes from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I do see our friend Bishop Andrew. Man. This is our brother from uh, Malawi. Uh, I just said hi to him. I'm crying. This is going to be a weird series. Uh, Bishop Andrew, it's great to see you, brother. Uh, we, are, we are doing uh, this series, you guys, because of what was prompted in the, from the Lord uh, of a dream. And, uh, you know, the dream was, was pretty simple. Uh, I was at my home with my wife and our kids, and I was sleeping, and I woke up, and I said, Laura, I have a dream. And I said, you know, whenever you have a dream, you don't know if it's from the Lord or not, so you always just, you write it down, and then you begin to test it out, and what does it look like, and it doesn't take long to share the dream, but I think it's important that you hear this, because this is why we're doing this series. And uh, I saw a stadium full of Africans, and I knew that there was a, she a scene change, so I saw the stadium full of Africans, and then I knew right away that I saw... Uh, the president of this country, the president of Malawi, and he was calling the entire nation to repent. That, that was my dream. And I knew in my spirit right away that that, 
that president was President Lazarus Chakwera uh, from Malawi. President Lazarus, by the way, what an incredible first name, uh, born again believer, loves the Lord, uh, used to be the president of the Assemblies of God Seminary of all of Malawi. So this guy is in the word. He knows uh, the, the Lord really on a personal level. And so when I heard this dream and had this dream <clears throat> right away, when I, I, I was like, I have to reach out to the president and say, this was my dream. But when you hear the word repent, and do you have your microphone, Laura? I want to open this up because I, before we get into this series, and by the way, people have asked, how long is this series going to go for? We already have a, a timeline. <laughs> And the reason we have a timeline is because we're going to do this series on repentance, a message of repentance for nine weeks starting today. Why nine weeks? Because by the time we're done, when we're done with our last lesson here in Texas, we will be then getting on a plane and flying to Malawi. And I wanted myself, my family, and our team to be so in tune with the Lord on a message of repentance. What does this say about repentance? So that if we are walking alongside our Malawian friends, I want to know what the word says about repentance. But it has a weird stereotype. When you say the word repent, what do you think of? And so Laura has a microphone. If you're online, I'd love for you to also jump in. What, what do you, when you think of the word repent, what do you think of? If you guys, do you have a comment? What's, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, but what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And let's use a mic if you have one, if you want to raise your hand. Okay, Wendy, what do you think of when you hear the word repent? When you said that, I thought of um, John the Baptist. But I guess he was the first one to use the word. John the Baptist. We'll get into all of that, okay? So you think of the word John the Baptist. He was also dressed kind of funny, right? He had weird clothes, and he was going ahead, right? And he was telling everybody, you need to repent. Okay, good. So you, you almost have an image with somebody, a person. Okay, Larry, what do you have? Physically, it means to go from one direction, turn 180 degrees, and go in the opposite direction. But what I think about is what, is, what are your eyes focused on? If you're yep. looking in this direction, south, yep. you turn 180, then you're looking north. You're yep. looking at something completely different. That's right. So we're supposed to focus our eyes on Jesus. Good, so you automatically think you're literally looking one way, and then because of the word repent, you're now you're physically looking somewhere else. That's a great image. Anybody else here? I see some things online. Uh, you know, some people are just commenting about what do you think of. I kind of missed it because I know it was going kind of fast. I, I saw a couple of people just said, you know, uh, turning around, right? That's typically what most people think. Betty Knapp from Flint, Mi Michigan just says, turn from your way that you're living in the flesh and then you live the way that God wants you to live. I think these are all great definitions and illustrations, okay? Uh, Kevin, what do you think of when you think of the word repent? I think of the guy screaming on the street corner, repent or go to hell. Yes. <laughs> like, I, I, uh, whenever you drive around in larger cities, but even here in Richardson, right, Laura, we saw a pole. Yeah. Would well, you remember what the pole had on it? Yeah, I remember driving out of our neighborhood and on the pole, it just said repent. And it had like all the Bible verses on repentance. And I just thought, Wow, someone felt led to print that out and like staple it on a pole in yeah. Richardson, Texas. You know, yeah. like, all right. Yes. Maybe the Lord will use that. <laughs> but it also, in a weird way, I have to tell you, when I see that, I kind of want to cringe. Like, repent or go to hell. Like, you see those signs, right? Or there's people holding up these big signs of people that you don't agree with, right? And they're holding up these things. I was at a coffee shop this morning. You'll hear probably stories as this thing unfolds. And I was sitting there and I had my notes out. I had my computer, I had my Bible. And I was just really beginning to study, like you know, beginning to study sounds like I just got ready an hour ago, uh, which could be the case as well. But as I was sitting there, the guy across from me, I, we just started talking. I loved his shoes. And I said, hey, what nationality are you? I'm always trying to figure this out because we're in many, many different nations with Revive School. Hence, we get to interact with a lot of our friends from overseas. And he said, well, I'm Vietnamese. And, uh, and then as we were starting to talk, I said, what do you do? And we started talking about that. And he said, well, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, okay. He's going to ask me about what I'm doing. And, and I, I was like, well, and I was kind of sheepish at first. I was like, honestly, I'm, I'm getting ready to teach a message on repent. And like, I felt like the whole coffee shop stopped. Like that guy just said the word repent. 
I love coffee shops, but there are times coffee shops can be a little bit liberal, right? Does that make sense when I say that? When I say liberal, I mean a little bit more loose according to this is what I mean. They don't necessarily adhere to this. And man, I started talking about repentance and it was really, really interesting because as we started to talk, like it made me feel like people feel judged when you say that word. And I actually think it's a message of repentance that not many people actually go there. I'm not saying pastors don't, I'm not saying teachers don't, but it's a message that we don't typically have a series in our church about repentance. You wanna know why? Because it rubs people the wrong way. You're basically saying, I want the Lord to examine my heart and I don't really want to because I know there's some stuff here that I don't necessarily wanna address. And so because of that, we just kind of keep shoving things behind the black curtain and we don't really talk about this. And I'll, maybe I'll get to the story maybe by the end of today. It was an incredible encounter where we're all crying. <laughs> and I think I got to give God a little bit more room to work on the word repent. Let God be God. Let the spirit of God work in people's lives. But I can't shy away from this truth. And I think as we get ready more and more for the return of Christ, my friend, you know, Ben Coblesso. Tom, where's our friend Ben Coblesso from? Togo. Yeah, we got a friend from Togo here. Our friend from Ghana here. As we're processing what repentance looks like, there's going to be times this chair. Okay, we have a yellow chair. Can you guys just do a shot of the yellow chair without anybody in it? Okay, this yellow chair, I want you to keep coming back to, if I was sitting in the chair of repentance, what would I be repenting of? Like if I spent time with the Lord over here and I really began to process this, and I took these messages, I took the word, I took the spirit of God, and I actually gave him room to work in my life. What are the things that I'm going to start addressing and I need to work through? And I think for me, a lot of us, by the way, I also feel like Mr. Rogers in this chair. You know, you just take off your shoes and put on a different pair of shoes. If you're from Africa, sorry, you don't get that. But what we're going to do today is we're going to dig into Scripture, Acts 26. Uh, we have it up on our screen for those that are online. If you're here in person, you're welcome to open it up. We're also here on a screen. And I want to just begin to unpack Acts 26. And I hear, here's why. Uh, because if we're going to call people to repent, we need to do it ourselves. And you're like, how can you do that for nine weeks? I, I think, I'll never forget this, I have a friend um, uh, he was in Alabama, and he taught a message on repentance for over 30 weeks straight. And he goes, it was the same message every Sunday. I go, why'd you preach for so long? He goes, because they didn't get it. I always wondered if this message today that we're going to give is the same one I'm going to give every nine weeks, or the same one, or will it be different? But the point is, in our heart is, is that when we put ourselves in a posture of actually wanting to turn away from something and turning to the Lord, I actually believe we might actually begin to see a genuine move of God. And I can't convince you of that. I can only show you what the Word of God says. And so, Father, we come before you today with all of our friends from all over the nations, online and for our friends here in the Dallas, Texas area. I pray that the Spirit would have the freedom to speak to us. That the Holy Spirit would begin to already reveal things in our lives just through the life of Paul, God, that we can learn from. And so we give this to you. We give you this text. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys would go to Acts 26, verse 1, and I, I process, do I really need to go through the backdrop? And the Lord goes, the backdrop is the message. So I'm going to just tell you that now. That's kind of weird. I'm going to give you a backdrop, but the backdrop is really what sets the tone for all of nine weeks. In Acts 26, verse 1, look what it says. It says, Agrippa said to Paul, it is permitted for you to speak for yourself. Kevin, right now the context of Paul is what? He's been arrested. He's before the king Agrippa. Yep. And uh, he's, he's on trial. Basically. He's on trial. He's getting ready to make his case. Now, this Agrippa guy... I'm just going to tell you, he's a weird dude. Think about Agrippa II. That's who this is. Agrippa II, right? He's a part of the Herod dynasty, right? You guys know when we say the Herod dynasty? His great-grandfather, King Herod, he's the guy that murdered all the babies uh, in Bethlehem. Trying to kill Jesus. So this is his, this is his lineage, right? His great-uncle, he, he murdered John the Baptist. He doesn't come from a great line, by the way. 
And don't worry, it gets even worse. His dad, Agrippa the first, he killed James. He imprisoned Peter. And by the way, Agrippa the first, you remember, he was the one eaten by worms. So this is his family lineage that Paul is presenting to. I don't know if you would be nervous, but I'm going to tell you some things Paul's thinking, right? And by the way, Agrippa II, here's where it gets even weirder. He's living with his sister, Bernice. And I'll just say this, and it's not good relations. It's not healthy. And so now Paul is coming and he just says, he stretched out his hand. It's, it's a form of like respect and honor, right? And he stretches out his hand to this person. The reason I'm telling you this is because the message that we're going to get to about what he's been called to do. Can you imagine what the King Agrippa II is thinking about the words that he's saying? This is his background, his lineage. He has murderers up and down, incest, up and down, like everything that's not good. And Paul's still going to go with this message. We've got to overcome, I'm just going to tell you this, repentance and the message of repentance, you, you cannot have a spirit of fear if you want to see God move in our country. You cannot have a spirit of fear if you want to see God move in Malawi or in Africa or overseas. Like, you have to overcome the fear, the, the fear of man is no longer existent in this message. And when I'm at this coffee shop and I'm saying, yeah, I'm teaching on repentance. Or, Laura, when, when our family went on spring break and I was on a second balcony, do you remember this, at a store? And I just wanted to get a hold of Laura and the kids, their attention. You know what you can do to get everybody's attention? Repent! I just yelled that word. It was so weird. And I wasn't telling my wife to repent, but it was kind of funny at that point. Yeah, nobody looked at me. That's the point. <laughs> I want to tell you this because that message is not easy to call your friends and say, hey, I, I believe God's asking us to repent. And he's coming before the king, King Agrippa II. And in verse 2 of Acts 26, he says, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that today I'm going to make a defense before you about everything that I'm accused by the Jews. So Paul is being accused by all kinds of things, especially since, and you see this, he recognizes that Agrippa II still knows the Jewish principles. He says, you're an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies, as it says. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. When a speaker says the word patiently, you know what that means? You're going to be here for a while. I need you to listen to this message. When I was sitting at the coffee shop, literally, when I actually sat down in front of my friends, okay, I thought this was really unique. I said, this is going to take a little bit. This is not a one and done and like, okay, I feel better. Repentance is not a, hey, I'm, I'm out. I, I feel so much better. It's an ongoing process. And these stereotypes of repentance for me, like, yeah, it is a sign that says repent or perish. That's actually biblical. But I want us to go through this whole nine weeks of understanding repentance is a couple things. One, it's for lost people, and it's also for believers. Repentance is for lost people or, and or for believers. Also, catch this. Repentance is for individuals or corporate. It could be for me but it also could be for my family. It could be for our nation. So my point is, is what we're going to do in scripture for the next nine weeks is we're going to be going to address the repentance to lost people, repentance to believers, repentance to individuals, and repentance to a corporate. Does that make sense? Like in Dallas, for years, we have been a part of prayer times that we were repentant because abortion started in, in the city of Dallas. And so we came corporately asking the Lord for forgiveness. And so I want us to have this mindset that repentance is not just for lost people, you guys. It should be an ongoing state for believers as well. Anybody, does that make sense? Kevin, am I clear? Is that? I think you made it plain. <laughs> and so in this, he says, I beg you to listen to me patiently. I got a lot to say. He says in verse 4, all the Jews... They know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem. Now, part of what you're going to see today, okay, in our teaching, it's going to be pretty unique. And, I, I'm, you know, in Revive School, if you're familiar with the Revive School, I reference a lot of Warren Wearsby. Warren Wearsby was a great theologian, pastor, teacher uh, from the Nebraska area. And what I want to do is I want to take Paul's life in order for us to understand how we can come to terms of repentance. Because if Paul, once he understands it, guess what? He can then ask people to repent as well. 
Does that make sense? So for me, the authority that you and I have of, of calling forth repentance is that we have to understand and embrace it as well. That's a big deal. So first of all, Paul, what does he just say, okay? First of all, we'll put this up on the screen here. Paul just says, I lived, I lived as a Pharisee, okay? That's one of his very first statements, okay? In this context, he said, look, you guys should know from the very, very beginning, right, uh, uh, from my own nation and in Jerusalem. They had previously, in verse 5, they had known me for quite some time. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. Part of, now hear me on this, okay? Part of us understanding repentance is understanding our background. Part of repentance is understanding where we come from. Okay? I'm not saying that because I was born in Indiana that that makes me a sinner. I'm just saying we have to understand and be willing to address our background. If you don't address our background, repentance doesn't take place. So verses 4 through 11 of Acts 26, you're going to begin to see this. But Kevin, if you would, would you go to Philippians 3 for me? Philippians 3 verses 5, 6, and 7. This is just a little bit more of a, of a backdrop here. Philippians 3, 5, 6, and 7. It says this, okay, he was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel. Paul also begins to describe, right, to the church of Philippi. I'm, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrews regarding the law, a Pharisee. It continues on, and it says this, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. What does Paul do? Paul clearly identifies his background. Okay? I'm not saying that background is sin. I'm just saying he's identifying his past. That's essential. Kevin, why do you think, why do you think that's an important step in order to move forward with repentance? Well, it plays into what you're turning from. Uh, you have things that you grow up with that are, they, they affect who you are becomes part of your identity, even though that's not your focused identity, it becomes part of your identity. Amen. And that's important. I think people are afraid to go there. And all I'm saying is, is in Paul's life, before you hear that he's a messenger of repentance, Paul says, man, this, this is me. And it continues on and he says in verse 6, And now I stand on trial, I'm back in Acts 26, And now I stand on trial on the hope of the promise made by God our fathers. The promise of our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I'm being accused by the Jews because of this hope. So here, here's what's crazy, you guys. Do you, do you fully get this? So the promise that, Rich, I want to go to you for a second. Like, what would be some of the promises that the fathers made from the Old Testament? What was he referencing? Uh, that they would be a chosen nation? Absolutely. That, um, are you talking like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I think all of the above. I think these are the promises. The Israelites are going to be a chosen nation. But they also, from Isaiah and Jeremiah... They heard constant prophecies about the Messiah. And so these forefathers, right, what did they keep? They kept hearing the scriptures. We studied 37 books in the Old Testament, the Torah and the Tanakh, right? And it all points to the Messiah. <laughs> and he's just saying, he's like, look, I'm standing on hope of the promise that was made to all of our forefathers. And oh, by the way, I'm a Pharisee because I understand this. He continues on. He says, this is the promise that was made to our 12 tribes. I mean... Robert, these 12 tribes are the classic, right? These are the 12 tribes of, of Israel that they are waiting. Literally, the, the 10 tribes and the two, they're waiting for the Messiah. And he says, by the way, everything that you've been waiting for, I'm now in trouble because I believe what was said. And he says, why is it, this is interesting, why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises from the dead? In fact, I myself suppose it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus the Nazarene. I'm in verse 10 of Acts 26. He says, I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison, since I had received authority that far, that, for that from the chief priest. So as a Pharisee, as a guy who went through all of these things, right, all of these pasts, all of these experiences, he says, look, I even imprisoned the people that believed this stuff. I killed people 
possibly, or I persecuted them, I prosecuted them. Some people actually believe he could have been the chief prosecutor, a prosecutor of, of possibly for the, for the Sanhedrin. Like he cast a vote. I mean, look at this. It says in verse 10, I did this. I locked up many saints since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Paul is identifying his past. These are the things that I did, and I'm going to just tell you this, against the Lord. Now, there are these things that we might unpack later on, sins of commission and sins of omission. Anybody want to try to explain that? Anybody have any thoughts? You want to raise your hand and try it? Okay, Larry, let's give you the mic if we can, just so people can hear this. Omission is something I do with full knowledge going forward. Omission is something I am convicted that I should be doing, but I can get away with not doing it because it's not overt, it's covert. It's beneath the surface. That's right. Amen. There are ways sometimes you know that you're doing sin and sometimes you don't know what you're doing sin, but it still can be sin. Paul is saying, look, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm still sinning. Does that make sense? I think this is really important to understand the area of repentance. Uh, I like Stephanie Benedict just wrote up here. Commission is partnering. Omission is ignoring. What Larry is saying. Great, great word. Great insight, by the way. And so just for a second, I, I don't want us to miss this aspect of our background. Look, I, I grew up in a very small town in northern Indiana. I loved it. I went to a, a very conservative church. Uh, I didn't know anything different, but that church did not believe that the Old Testament was still true. But I didn't know that. But that was my culture. That's how I grew up. And so my point is, there are areas in our lives, you guys, that are omission and commission, but it still could be sin. Paul understood his background, and I just I have to keep going back to this. Background is important in order, in order to move forward. When you look at the text as well, if you would, just keep joining me here. I think this is really important. He says this in verse 11. Uh, finally, this is the, the last section here uh, of this segment here. Verses 4 through 11, Paul is talking about this. He says, uh, in all the synagogues, I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them. So what did he try to do? Speak against Christ. He tried to torture them or persecute them and say, say against Christ. Turn your back against Christ. I tried to do everything I can, you guys, by punishing. I even pursued them to foreign cities. I was so greatly enraged at them. He was so adamant, you guys, against Christ. Anybody that talked about Jesus, he was going against them. Now, there are a lot of people out there, when you talk about repentance, you're like, well, that's not me. I'm not trying to kill people. I'm not persecuting Christians. Totally fair. I do think it's important, though. Please go there and do not be afraid to identify your past. Do not be afraid to examine your background because in that process, we call this the chair of repentance for us. I think we need a time of just sitting down and saying, God, would you just start revealing to me some things that impact everything I do from my past? And you know what that does? It takes time. And we are people, and myself included, that does not want to take time. It's interesting, though, when you start taking time, as Wearsby says, uh, let me just make sure I get this. To, I think this is really cool. I saw a light. In verse 12 and 13. Paul says, I was traveling. Remember, who's he talking to? King Agrippa II. He has an audience with the government. And basically, in him recognizing his past, can I just tell you this? You will always connect with people. When you're talking about the Lord, when you recognize you were this and then you became this. When you are humble and transparent about, man, I had a whole lot of junk in my past. Like, do you think I like telling you that I grew up in a church that didn't believe half the Bible was true? That's embarrassing. I was getting ready to preach on the book of Jonah, and the pastor said to me, you can't preach on that. That's a fable. 
And I said, what? But you know what that did? I started to ask the Lord. I didn't know the Old Testament the way I should, which has impacted how I perceive the Messiah. And I didn't even know that. And so in the process, Paul just says this. He says this in verse 12. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances. Circumstances being what? Killing people, persecuting. With authority and commission from the chief priest. There's nothing like carrying a letter that says nobody can do anything with me because I have the authority. And Paul says this. I had the authority. But then in verse 13, King Agrippa. He's talking to them in their face, the Justins, the Michaels that I talked to at the coffee shop today. While on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. In the middle of Saul persecuting and living in his life, Jesus shows up. And I have to tell you, if you want to move from your background to a future with direction, it has to involve Jesus. But I also want to say this. You can't just talk about Jesus without talking about the things that you need to be set free from. We've become, we've diluted the gospel message. Okay, we have these five colors, right? We talk about the message of Christ, sin and death, and right, you get into the love. But I think we don't talk about the sin and the death. We only talk about the love of God. That's a strange theology, and it's not biblical. And what I want to propose to you is, is that when you realize here, Jesus... Jesus will show up in your life. And he says, I saw a light brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. When you think of Jesus being the light, I think you have to go to John 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's really clear. It's the seven I am's, right, in the Gospels. If you can go there for me, Kevin. John 8, verse 12, the scripture just says, then Jesus spoke to them again and he said, I am the light of the world. Anybody who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have what? Scripture just says, the light of life. Now, this is important in the area of repentance. Light should reveal things. Light should not cause us to run from things. Does that make sense? I want to give you a text here that will show this. John 3, verse 19 uh, and 20. John 3, 19 and 20. This is a big deal, and this is a key in understanding repentance for everything else. John 3, verse 19 says, this then is the judgment. The light has come into the world, okay? The light came to Paul. Light came to Saul. The light has come to us, and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were what? The scripture continues, were evil. And then it says in verse 20, for everybody who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it. Nobody wants to sit in the chair of repentance, Nobody wants to sit here and have the Lord shine his light on us because why? It reveals the darkness in our life. We're exposed. But when you're willing to say, God, I do have a past. I do have a background. I do have this. I'm willing to let the light shine on me. Then in that case, you will get a revelation from the Lord. You'll see who he is and he sets you free. And so I think when you go from the background to I saw the light, look at this. It says, so that his deeds may not be exposed. When the light shines on you, you really have only two options in the area of repentance. You either respond or you're repulsed. <laughs> you either respond or you run behind the curtain. Does that make sense? Paul understood his background and Jesus just showed up. Interesting enough, um, <laughs> He's telling King Agrippa this, his story. And as you go into verses 14, I should put this up here, sorry. Uh, verses 12 through 13, this is really where it gets fun. In verses 14 through 18, then Paul begins to say, I heard a voice. This might be a different way that you're going to approach repentance. But Paul personally has to experience this in order to communicate it. Jesus showed up in light. And the next thing you know, it's a voice. 
Scripture says in Acts 26, verse 14, he's telling King Agrippa, he's telling Festus, he's telling the wife, the sister, he's telling the other military people in the room, in the palace. He says, we all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language. That's, by the way, incredible. Saul, Saul, why, why are you persecuting me? Remember, he can't, there's a lot of light. Now he hears this. Scripture continues on in verse 15. It's hard for you to kick against the goads, the goads. Goads, Kevin? Goads. Goads. Goads, goads. We're not perfect. Here's, this is an interesting text. Now watch this. In verse 14, we fell to the ground. A voice began to speak to me, right? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? Here's the backdrop, okay? Nelson's commentary says this, when an ox is first yoked, right? Kevin, what's that mean, the ox is yoked? He's ready to be worked. Yeah, and what's put on him? Uh, basically a big harness. A big harness, right? All of a sudden it's put on him and he's getting ready to do some work. Usually when you're first given this, you're res you resent the burden and you don't want it on. And so you know what the oxen do? They just start kicking, like, get, get it off. You ever, you ever, you just, you don't want to carry it. And if the ox was yoked to a single-handed plow, the plowman knew that the oxen weren't going to want to do this. So they'd hold a long staff out like this with a sharpened end close to the heels of the ox. So when the ox would try to kick it off, they'd kick it. Guess what? There was a stick there with a sharp end. And guess what? You kick it. Guess what you hit? That sharp end of the stick. Doesn't sound like a real pleasant process. If the ox were yoked to this wagon and, and there was a bar with spikes, it, like the point is, is like you have to learn to submit to the yoke the hard way. Hang in there with me on this one. This is, a, this is kind of really, really important. He said, it's hard for you because you don't like what I'm taking you through. You don't like in the submission side of things. Look, I'll just tell you this. In part of understanding the light and the voice, you're going to have to submit. You're going to have to recognize these things in your life. And by the way, it's time that we learn to submit to the voice. 1 Timothy, if you'll go there, Kevin. 1 Timothy 1, write this down if you would, please. 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 and on. Go to 12 first, will you, Kevin? 1 Timothy 1, verse 12 and 13. 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13. He says this, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Now watch this in verse 13. One who was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man, but I submitted and received the mercy. I acted out of ignorance. There's that whole thing, you guys, that we talked about, commission and omission, right? I acted out of a mission and out of ignorance, and it says this, and it keeps going, in unbelief. And so here you have these labels of Paul. I was a blasphemer. By the way, I spoke against God. I was a persecutor. I used physical force to hurt people, and I was an arrogant man. You guys, the reality is, that when we begin to hear the Lord's voice, it's time to recognize who we are and that we need to receive his mercy. Nobody likes to be labeled as the guy that's arrogant. Laura, there was a, a video, I think, when I went down to Waco, and I said in the video to this kid, I have a problem sometimes with this random outburst of anger that lasts like one, one second. Like it's short, and it's dumb, and it's not from the Lord. But I have to be okay saying, but Jesus can help me in that. If you had to start labeling yourselves, and you could say, well, Kyle, I'm a child of God. I don't live in that place. I understand that. But in order to understand repentance, you have to be willing to identify those things in your life. There's nobody, there's nobody perfect. Kevin, can you go to, uh, can you keep going under this text to verse 14? It says, and I said, uh, no, go back. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 1. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, if you'll go back there to verse 14. And it just says this, remember this, and then the grace of our Lord overflowed along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
When there is a submission, please understand that the mercy and the grace is overflowing. He's not here to punish us. He's here to welcome us and heal us. Kevin, you got anything into that? Anything else you need to clear up? Uh, I think it's what I see when I look at those two statements you got written up on the board. There's a seeing and a hearing. Yep. It's, it's playing into all of our senses. So, and you have to, you have to respond. There Amen. has to be some kind of response to that. Amen. You guys know this, but write this down with, uh, I heard a voice, if you would, just John 10. 27 and 28, if you'll go there, Kevin. John 10, 27 and 28. Again, what we're going to try to do today is just set this up for the whole week. Okay, that's our whole goal. That's our desire. John 10, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and then they follow me. Verse 28 it says, I give them eternal life and they'll never, they will never perish. Ever. No one will snatch him out of my hand. So when you hear this story of Paul, I lived as a Pharisee, but then praise God, I had a revelation. The light of Christ came into my life. And then I began to hear his voice and I began to recognize who I was. In Acts 26, verse 15, he just says this. Then I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one who you're persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For I've appeared to you for this purpose. Paul, I now have a purpose in your life. We've, we've recognized your past. Now, can I just tell you this? In all of scriptures, you don't ever see a time where Paul physically in scripture, in the word, say, I have repented. Just want you to know that. But guess what? His lifestyle reflects everything that he has repented. Everything. So you can't theologically argue, well, Paul never preached repentance. He absolutely did. He lived it more than anything. How do I know? Because he was a, a, a persecutor, a blasphemer, an arrogant man. And by the way, Paul, I now have a whole new mission. Get on your feet, and I've appeared to you for this purpose. I have a plan in your life. You can't live in this place of being a Pharisee. I have so much more for you. In the scripture, then, he just says this. Here's what I want you to do. Okay, I've appointed you as a servant and a witness of what you've seen and what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That by faith in me, they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified. You know, in Colossians 1, verses 12 through 14, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, what do you see? You see Paul doing this. To the church of Colossae, he says, if you'll go there, Kevin, Colossians 1, if you can, verses 12 and 13 and, and 14, it says this. It says, giving thanks to the Father who's enabled you to share this in the saints' inheritance in the light. Verse 13, he's rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And then it gets on in, the, in verse 14. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. He's now communicating this to the church of Colossae. What he received on the road to Damascus, what he's saying to King Agrippa II, he's doing this everywhere to the church. Why? Because he understood what he's been set free from. And here's where, in verse 19, uh, this was the verse, 19 and 20, that the Lord gave me for Malawi. And he said, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. No, I didn't have a vision. I had a dream. But I needed to be obedient to go before President Lazarus Chakwera, and I needed to tell him what I saw and what the message should be. And it says this in verse 20. He says, I wasn't disobedient to this, by the way. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles. So he went to all of these places. Watch this. Okay. So this is where he went. So the Apostle Paul, he has an encounter from the Lord. He understands his background. I'm going to keep beating this, okay, into our mind. He understands his background. He had a light from Christ. He heard from the Lord, and now all of a sudden he's got to start living this thing out. And he starts going to Damascus. Rich, where did he all go to? You helped make this map. Where, where, did, where did the Apostle Paul in this text did he start going to? In the text, he went to uh, Judea, which is in the orange, and then 
uh, Samaria, which is in the green, and then Damascus are in the blue. This was his message. And his message was this in Acts 26, verse 20. Thanks, Rich. His message was this. <laughs> and it's not really uplifting. They should repent, turn to God, and do works worthy of repentance. You cannot communicate this message. You cannot communicate this message unless you've experienced this yourself. And remember, by the way, it's a first time for the lost, but it's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process as believers. We're going to get to that later on, but please understand this. And it says this, uh, I heard a voice, and by the way, I was not disobedient. I understand my background. I had an encounter with the Lord, the light of Christ. I heard from him. And by the way, I'm no longer disobedient to what he's asking us to do. And that comes into verses 19 through 21. And there's three things that we are going to unpack for the next eight weeks after today. We are going to unpack three key phrases. Repent. <laughs> We're also going to focus on turn to God. And then the one that I think is not just lost, because I think all three of these are lost, to be honest, in the church, is do works worthy of repentance. You guys, you understand this quote. You understand these phrases. Uh, but I want to begin to understand and define a couple of these. Uh, so if we can, let's do this in just our brief time that we have. Let's begin to look at this word, re repent. Again, we're going to unpack this for the rest of the series, but as an overview. I think it's understand. Remember, Paul's job is to what? Paul's job is to call him to repent, turn to God, and do works worthy of repentance. I was like, God, if this was my message in every coffee shop, I'm going to cringe. You need to repent. Like, that's the message. That's the word. That's what he's communicating. In the word repent, it can be defined many, many different ways. Here's my attempt. It's a change of mind that leads to a change in life. A change of mind, right? In Romans 12, it says the renewing of the mind, right? That we've talked about. A renewing of the mind. You're now turning away from these things, and you're now changing literally who you are. Repentance is a change of mind, not just saying it, but now you're, you're actually living it out into a change of life. So if I'm going to talk about this outburst of anger that I have that comes every four days for one second, guess what? It needs to stop. I'm going to start talking through what does that look like. There's lots of different uh, Greek words, Hebrew words. I don't want to overwhelm you all with them. I'd like to. But there's three specific Greek words. Here's what you just need to know. There's a change of mind that produces a regret and a remorse of sin, but not necessarily a change of heart. Okay, that's one of the definitions of a Greek, of the Greek word. There's another one where it changes your mind and purpose, resulting of knowledge. I'm not writing down the Greek words, okay? But the third Greek word then also could mean there's a true repentance, a change of mind and purpose and life, and the remission of sin is gone. It's past. The whole point is, is eventually your end goal is to repent from what you've been doing to get to a new place in Christ. Interesting enough, I think this is a, can you go to the Harry Ironside quote for me, Kevin, the very first one? If you guys don't know Harry Ironside, great man of God. What is repentance? It's a complete change of attitude. It's a right about face. Here's a man who's going on living in open, flagrant sin, and he does not care anything about the things of God and is totally indifferent to the claims of righteousness. But laid hold of by the Spirit of God, that man suddenly comes face to face with his sins in the presence of God. And he turns right about face and comes to the God he's been spur spurning and to the Christ he's been rejecting. And he confesses his sins and puts his trust in the Savior. All of this is involved in repentance. Now, this is an understanding of a lost person. Does that make sense? There's another type of man. Let's go to the la another quote. I know they're long, but I think, this is, I think this helps for me. Here's another man. He's not living in open sin, but he's been living a very religious life. 
He's been very self-righteous. He's been thoroughly satisfied that because of his own goodness and because of his punctilious attention to his religious duties, God will accept him and eventually take him to be with himself. But suddenly he's brought to realize that all of his own righteousness are as filthy rags that nothing he can do will make him fit for God's presence. And he faces this honestly before God. For him to there is a change of attitude. He turns away from all confidence in self, the flesh, his religion, and cries, in my hand, no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. This is repentance. It is a right about face. You see, I think what happens when we think of the word repent, we think, well, I'm not a drunkard. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not you fill in those things, the fornicators, these drastic things. But man, there's a whole self-righteous world that needs to be addressed as well. And all of it comes before the Lord in a spirit of repentance. I hope that makes uh, sense. Kevin, you got any comment on that? I think there's just... We're going to find there's a lot of different aspects of repentance as we go through these nine weeks. And these are just two, two individual two aspects. perspectives. And, and there, there's, there's just a lot here. Can you imagine saying, I've been called to call people to repent, and you're standing in front of a group of the second? I just want to keep bringing that uh, to realization. One other aspect of this, of this word, repent. Uh, in Acts 17, please, please, please circle this, highlight this in your Bible. Acts 17, verse 30. This is really interesting. And then this takes off the whole pressure of us, and it's the Lord. Acts 17, watch this, in verse, I don't, I don't know where I was when I studied this earlier on, but in verse 30 it says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. I just, I want to clarify, uh, Wendy, the word all means what? <laughs> all. <laughs> and then people everywhere, Nicole, what, where is everywhere? <laughs> everywhere. So people in Togo, people in Malawi, people in America, people in Nepal, people in North Dakota, people in Flint, Michigan. The reality is people in Dallas, everywhere people need to live in this posture of repentance. So Paul's message, first and foremost, is, guys, by the way, I need you to repent. I love this quote, by the way, from uh, Preston's commentary. Genuine repentance is evidenced by a change of behavior. I'm going to keep coming back to this, you guys. If we're not seeing repentance, turning to God, to doing works of, worthy of repentance, you have missed this whole nine-week series. Repentance is not just staying in your chair repenting. It's repenting and then looking different, sounding different communicating different, looking like Jesus. And I don't know you guys, I have been to a lot of things in our country where we've called people to repent, and I actually think their heart is right. I think those things are good things, but why are we not seeing genuine change? I don't, I don't know that answer. But my prayer is, is by the end of these series, you'll have a better grasp of your own life. And Paul just says, look, here's the reality. My job is to call people to repent and look what it says. If you'll go back, Kevin, to Acts 26, to repent and what? Turn. In Acts 26, it says, and turn to God. So I'm a visual guy. So if I am repenting from arrogance, if I'm repenting from pride, okay, I've already accepted the Lord, but I still have these issues in my life, okay, I am now turning away from those things, right? I'm turning away from those things, even to our friend in Rwanda. Praise the Lord for Rwanda. Even if I'm turning away these things, I have to recognize what am I turning to? Just because I'm turning away from arrogance and pride doesn't mean you're turning to God. But that's the goal of repentance, to turn to God, to keep your eyes on Him. And that word repent and turn, by the way, they pretty much just go together. As much as I'd love to say, hey, here's repent and then here's turn, the reality is, they, they're buddies. Repent and turn, just they, they go hand in hand. It's Kyle and Laura. We go together. <laughs> right? I mean, I thought so. <laughs> okay. Re turning is, is like, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a regular aspect of Paul's preaching. He doesn't just say repent. He says, and turn to God. 
That message is incomplete if we just say repent. It must say and turn to God as well. That's just a long sermon title to say a message of repentance and turn to God. We just, we didn't put it there. But in Acts 14 verse 15, watch this. I I just want to make sure we understand. Acts 14 verse 15, you'll see this up on your screen as well. Scripture says this, Acts 14 verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? We are men also with the same nature as yours, and we are proclaiming good news to you that what? Scripture just says, you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You know why I love this text right here at Acts? Because he did it all. Why would you turn to anything else that's man-made? They're worthless. They don't last. You know how many times I have to pump my kids' bicycle tires? Those are great things. I love riding bikes. But guess what? It's still going to go flat sometime. My God never does. My God is the living God who made the heaven and the earth. Turn to him who made everything. And so in this process, just one other aspect I want us to understand. Have we and are we willing to turn from my idols to serve the living and true God? Don't go there, Kevin. You don't even need to go there. But 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10. That's what I want you to understand. We're turning to the living God. We're turning away from worthless things to the living God. I cannot emphasize enough to my kids, to those that are around me. Temporary things are temporary. Eternal things are eternal. And Paul's message to King Agrippa, he says, hey, this is what I've been called to in Judea and Samaria and everywhere else. Repent and turn to God. I don't understand why the Jews are mad. I'm actually fulfilling what they already wrote about. Repent and turn to God. The scripture just says, and I just will close with this last just simple text. And the text just goes back to Acts 26. And I want you to do works worthy of repentance. You're implying I've received his mercy. You're implying I've received his grace. You're implying I have received his love. I now have a focus. And because I've been set free of these things, I'm doing works because I've been set free for the Lord. Does that make sense? I don't know why the repentance message stops on the front end of repent and turn to God. I don't, I don't know why. I think it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you have certain bumper stickers. You quote half of it because it works and it applies. I actually think a message of repentance is incomplete if we don't talk about the works worthy of repentance. I want people to know that I'm a changed man in Christ. And I'm beginning to wonder if we're really not genuinely repenting. I'm serious. Because I don't think we're doing works worthy of repentance at times. Why? Because we don't like the light shining on our stuff. I actually think many people don't share the gospel in the United States or all all over because we're hiding so much stuff in the darkness. Can I do this, guys? We don't. We don't want anything exposed. (laughs) We don't. But when you put yourself in the light and he has revealed everything, you'll want to tell everybody what he's done. Yesterday, there was a male lady. She brought a package for Rich. I went running running out after her. She's 21 years old in the United States, and she's never heard the message of Jesus Christ. We say that all the time, Martha. We hear that everywhere we go. The only reason I can conclude is because there's not a genuine repentance in the church. Because if I talk to that lost person, I might be exposed of really who I am. But when there's works worthy of repentance, Matthew 3, and we're going to unpack this, this this next eight weeks. But guess what? In Luke 3, 8 and in Matthew, it says you will produce fruit consistent with repentance. Do you catch this? Fruit that is consistent with repentance is Acts 26, verse 20. Matthew 3, 8, Luke 3, it's all of it. When we have, we'll have fruit because we're living in a repentance posture. So if you have to ask yourself, am I fruitful in my life? If you're not, guess what? I would really challenge you to sit in the chair of repentance and say, God, what do I need to repent of so I can begin to experience fruit? Because when we repent and turn to God, you will do works 
worthy of repentance. And literally, over the next eight weeks, we're going to unpack that. And then over a couple other weeks, we're going to unpack that. And then over the end of the couple weeks, we're going to unpack that. And I, I wonder, I wonder when we begin to unpack that, uh, if we'll begin to understand what it means to live a life of holiness and genuine faith. Uh, I'm kind of bummed, because I actually had a whole lot more here today of like, how do we go through repentance? How do we turn to God? But that's why this is a summary. <laughs> That's why this is just a bigger picture. And Can you go back to Acts 26, Kevin, as we wrap it all up here, just so we have closure to this text. In Acts 26, right, when he says, by the way, this is my message. Look what it says. If you go to verse 21, uh, he says, For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. So can I just tell you this? When you live out a message of repentance and you do the works, you turn to God and you do the works worthy of repentance, I'm just going to tell you this, there's a really good chance people won't like your message. In the church and in the lost community. Hmm. Verse 22, he's still talking, right, to King Agrippa? To this very day, I have obtained help that comes from God, and I stand and I testify to both great, small, and great. In verse 23, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. He says that the Messiah must suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. Uh, we're going to just stop right there, but I, I do want to write one thing up here for everybody so you see this. You remember how Paul said he wasn't disobedient, right? And I love this. This is what Wearsby concludes with everything. And he says, I continue unto this day. And he gets into verses 22 through 32. So what that means is it's an ongoing process. Not only is the message an ongoing process, uh, but also it is in his own life. And I think when you can begin to understand Saul, and he became Paul in Christ, you'll begin to understand Acts 26, 19 and 20 a whole lot more. This is just a setup. My prayer and my hope is that this begins to make progress and process in your mind. And I just thought, uh, joking aside, I'm not trying to be funny anymore, just when you sit in this chair of uh, processing, repent, turn to God, and doing works worthy of repentance, I just, if we can just pray, can we just do that right now? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the Lord's saying to you or to those our friends online. Um, this is a, just a big old backdrop, but it's really the main message. And so, Father, we come before you right now. I know we don't have music. We don't have a whole lot of anything except we're just coming before you and saying, God, we want to understand repentance more. And I thank you for those that maybe are listening in this room, those that are online that have already experienced genuine repentance and they are now saved in Christ. They've been justified in Christ. I praise you for that, God. But there's still an ongoing process that... I really believe each one of us needs to be set free from so that we can continue to do the works worthy of repentance. So God, show us these areas in our life that are getting in the way. I'll just, I'm going to practically release. Just I, I feel like vehicles, uh, people value vehicles more than the Lord. Uh, the drive for money. Uh, spirit of control. God, would you speak to us in this moment? What are areas in our life?
God, I just pray that, I pray that this would just be the beginning of uh, us tuning in to you more. God, shine the light on my life. I want to radically turn to you, and I want to radically impact others for the kingdom. And so I thank you for Saul's life that became Paul in Christ. And we commit this to you. We commit this message to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for coming today. Thanks for going through a lesson that we didn't know how it's going to unpack. Uh, but I'm really, really, really thankful for each one of you. Thanks for joining us online. For those that stayed up later in Africa, some of you joined in earlier in Asia, in the Pacific. Uh, very, very grateful for each one of you guys. And uh, I, I'm just going to do this just because we can. This is totally of the Lord. Shelly, can you throw up that article or Kevin? You guys, this happened today. Today. March 30th. The president of Malawi in the newspaper called the nation for repentance. Malawi President uh, Dr. Lazarus Chakwera on Wednesday took time off of his busy schedule to attend uh, the Eminent Persons Forum, which was organized by the, uh, a group of believers, the Evangelical Associations of Malawi. And in his remarks, President Chakwera, who is a renowned preacher and church minister, asked Malawians to repent of their sins and look at the biblical example and to look to God. Saying, and look, you even know this now, he tied it to the living God, to the creator who is rich in mercy and gives hope where there seems to be none. I just think this is an incredible, you get the picture, you can say to the top, that's okay. It just goes on to more of the article. But you guys, we had an opportunity last, this last January, two months ago, to go meet with the president, to share the dream with him and to encourage him with the local church. And so when we went, we met with 3,000 pastors. We met with the president, and he's communicating the message. Hallelujah. I can't wait to see what God's going to do in that country. All it takes is one person. Uh, Bishop Andrew, uh, my friend, was at that meeting. Praise God. Thanks for going, uh, coming and joining us online. Uh, thank you for being here in person. Uh, we'll do it again next week, Thursday at the same time. So bless you guys and have a great day online. Good night, guys.